course of preparing for that webinar, of a few weeks I did research, I learned more about Samson Occam than I had in all the years I had taught him. Because I'd come to his, his day in the, in the syllabus, you know, we'd spend one class on Samson Occam and on, you know, it was, it was Thursday, it was somebody else. So I never got beyond sort of a fairly superficial sense of him. So um, I can tell you more of that, and I will talk about him at, at great length later. But the story of Occam and Dartmouth. Um, Wheelock was born in 1711. Eliezer Wheelock was born in 1711 in Connecticut. He went to Yale, graduated in 1732 or so and immediately got posted to the Congregational Church in Lebanon, where he remained. Um, Ockham was born 10 years later. Um, in the 30s and 40s, you had the phenomenon of the Great Awakening, which was a revival movement which began in England and uh, spread to the colonies, and it was particularly, I think, uh, strong in the Northeast, particularly in New England, uh, and the name, if, if, if you've heard of it, you might well not, you might associate it with the Puritan preacher, Jonathan Edwards, who would travel around preaching hellfire and brimstone uh, sermons with names like sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, the idea of the awakening uh, for, for English settlers was to revive the piety of the previous generations. This is the second century of, of, the, of, of occup occupation and res residence here. And the, the Protestants felt, you know, that the original piety had been lost and the standards were slipping uh, and people were coming to church. That was all very nice. But the idea of the revival was that these, these itinerant preachers, they would, they would come to your church from somewhere else and they would tell you, you might be here, you might think you're saved, but you can't be sure, so be careful. And, you know, they would try to stri strike fear into the hearts uh, of the uh, churchgoers. There was another aspect or another wing of, of the revival, and that was to go into the, into the so-called wilderness uh, and preach to the natives and convert them. Um, in any case, um, the Occams were caught up in this. Wheelock was caught up in it. He actually left his congregation to go off evangelizing in other, in other churches to the extent that his, North, his Lebanon church actually docked his pay for, for absence. And to make it up, he founded a school uh, for, for, for white kids uh, on his property and got income that way. Um, meanwhile, um, Occam's mother, Sarah, got converted in New London, and she was converted, we think, probably by an evangelist trained uh, in this humble building on Truman Street in New London. It's known as the Shepherd's Tent. It's not a tent. <laughs> it's a building, and they were shepherds. They were evangelists. So this was called the Shepherd's Tent because this is where evangelists congregated and planned their moves. I'll go here, you'll go there. Um, so it was really kind of um, a training center for um, evangelists during the Great Awakening. It still exists. It doesn't look like that anymore. It's recently been cited by yet an, another thing, but it's still there. It hasn't been destroyed right next to the laundry at the end of Truman Street. Um, we're hoping it'll, it won't be destroyed because <clears throat> um, it's one of the oldest buildings uh, in downtown New London. Um, uh, so um, Sarah Ockham uh, gets converted um, in New London. Samson, uh, her son, gets converted in Norwich by a, a man named uh, James Davenport. And <clears throat> Sarah apparently was working as a domestic for uh, Eliezer Wheelock in his homestead uh, in Columbia. This little town, <laughs> this little village was known at the time for the charming name of Lebanon Crank. And apparently Crank referred to a sharp turn in the road. Uh, and this is before steering wheels, so it had nothing to do with cranking a turn. Who knows? But it's now known as Columbia, and it's a charming little village. Um, most of the buildings, I actually went to the research for the Dartmouth paper. Most of what you see there now wasn't there in Occam's time. There's a building there that passes for the, the Indian Charity School, but it wasn't the building um, that, uh, that um, Wheelock used uh, at the time. So, but, so his mother is working, we think, as a domestic in this house, and she arranges with Wheelock to have her son, Samson, come and study with him. So in the 1740s, <clears throat> um, Ockham apparently moved to Lebanon. He may have lived, probably lived with Wheelock, um, and studied. He learned Latin, Greek, and some Hebrew. Wheelock was grooming him to go to Yale, his own alma mater. But somehow the process of education that was maybe so exhausting that by the, by the time he was 
old enough to go. By the time, but by the time four years of uh, education had passed, he was exhausted and he didn't go. Uh, instead, he started teaching and preaching uh, in this area among the Mohegan and neighboring tribes. In the 1750s, um, he went with a fishing um, party to Montauk, and he, he wound up staying there and marrying a Montaukett woman named Mary Fowler, with whom he had 10 children over the next 25 years. So, um, Wheelock's experience with Occam was that which I think encouraged him to found Moore, what is known as Moore's Indian Charity School. Um, as I said, if you go to Lebanon, you'll see a building that says that on it, but you can tell it's a Greek revival building. We know it wasn't the building in the, in the middle of the 18th century. <clears throat> um, but it, it, ser it served as a schoolhouse uh, after, after, after his time, so it's sort of interesting as, as a period piece. Um, <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Occam went to Montauk, did some preaching, did some teaching, um, and he came back in the 1760s. Um, I just to see what, where I am here. Oh, sorry, skip the slide. So he had enough of a reputation at this time so that his portrait was painted by this portrait artist, Nathaniel Smybert. Smybert was a Boston artist, uh, considered the first. Um, American portraitist, and it's really quite remarkable that he did a portrait of Occam. Uh, this is in the Bowdoin College collection. I think it came to them titled An Indian Priest, and eventually they figured out it's got to be Occam. And I think, I think they're pretty sure it is Occam. I think it probably had to be Occam because he was, I think, the guy who was known as the Indian priest in his day. And you'll see, I'm going to show you some different pictures of Occam in a minute. You'll see the difference. Here, you know, he captures Occam in a kind of casual clothes with a robe around him, um, a striking profile, something around his neck, uh, and natural scenery in the background. Um, but at some point uh, in the 60s, Occam came back to this area, to Mohegan, and he built a house like this. He probably would have lived in a wigwam as a child, um, but by this time, he was sufficiently acculturated, uh, somehow had the means to uh, build this house. Uh, this house is actually the same house type as the shepherd's tent. It's a three-bay building, chimney on one side. It's a pretty humble uh, early 18th century house form. <clears throat> um, he began to raise money for the charity school, which uh, um, Wheelock had founded in 1753, I think. So the, the school is in its second decade by now. It's being pretty successful. And Wheelock thinks, well, we've got a cadre of the pretty well-educated native youth. They need to have a college to go to. I'll found a college. Uh, so he shops around and he picks the town of Hanover. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But we need, we need some money. <laughs> so he sends Occam to the British Islands with uh, another uh, minister who's white named Whitaker. And Ockham travels all over England, Scotland, and Ireland. He preaches about 300 sermons in a couple of years. He meets all kinds of dignitaries. He's awarded an honorary doctorate. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have a BA, <laughs> if there was such a thing. He gets an honorary doctorate from Edinburgh University. He gets a contribution from King George III, and he raises a very large, uh, he gets a very large donation from a man named William Legge, L-E, I'm guessing it's a pronunciation, L-E-G-G-E, -E, maybe it's Legge, I don't know, <laughs> who was the second Earl of Dartmouth, Lord Dartmouth. So the college gets its name from the money given by Lord Dartmouth, who was inspired by Occam's preaching. That's where the name comes from. Occam comes home, um, and he discovers that Wheelock had not been taking care of his family the way he promised he would. And he's pretty upset about that. Um, and then he gets upset by something even worse. Uh, Wheelock moves the school, Moore's Indian Charity School, to Hanover, and he founds Dartmouth, so they're sort of side-by-side -side institutions in Hanover, the idea is that the graduates of Moors will enter Dartmouth, and it'll be that'll be their their feeder school. <clears throat> they would they, Dartmouth would take other Indian youth educated elsewhere as well, but it didn't work out very well for whatever reason. 
there probably wasn't that large a talent pool. Um, and, you know, it was probably hard for natives to make this, this adjustment to, to prepare for college education. In any case, very few graduates of Moors went on to Dartmouth, and pretty quickly, a Wheelock completely abandoned the mission. Um, got ahead of self, myself again. <clears throat> but uh, while um, uh, Ockham was in, in England, in the British Isles, um, he, he attracted a quite, quite a great deal of, of, uh, of attention. Um, and so much so that he, his portrait was painted there as well. So he had a, he had a portrait painted here. And notice the difference with this portrait. This portrait was painted, uh, this is not the portrait by Mason Chamberlain, but a portrait was painted by, of him by Mason Chamberlain, John Ma after Mason Chamberlain, who was an English portraitist uh, who was most famous for a portrait of, of Benjamin Franklin with his a lightning rod in the background. Um, that painting apparently disappeared, but before it did, uh, an etcher named um, Jonathan Spilsbury did a mezzo tint, and that was the basis of this painting by Edna Tenney in the 19th century. So Tenney kind of colorizes the mezzo tint, and presumably, so I think we can imagine that the painting by Mason Chamberlain probably looked sort of like this, all right? So this is very different from the earlier portrait. Here he's dressed up in clerical garb. He's got the clerical collar on instead of a fancy, a shiny black suit on. He's seated at a desk. He's pointing to scripture. But in the background, on the wall, uh, hang a spear and two arrows, symbols of the culture which the weapons he's put down. Now I'll argue that the weapons he's picked up are in the book. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, the next slide, I'd love to see, I love this, uh, which, <laughs> if not, I think, I think they're, they're, they're garbed identically. On the left, you have Samson Ockham. On the right, you have a portrait of Eliezer Wheelock, his supposed mentor, well, he was a mentor, <clears throat> um, painted in the 90s when Dartmouth was well established. So Wheelock is in some kind of a study, he's got a rug, he's got a bookcase behind him, he's seated at a desk with his legs crossed, he's got his hand on a scroll, which I'd love to be able to read. I'm thinking maybe it's the charter of the college. Uh, and through the window, you can see the, the campus. Um, we, we have described the, the picture of, of Occam. So the difference is, well, they're wearing the same thing. They have pretty much exactly the same pose. I love the fact that they're back to back because it makes them mirror, mirror images. But I think the main difference is, well, skin color and hair. It looks like Occam's real hair, but it looks like Eliezer's wearing a wig in any case. But the point, the part of the point is to show you how Wheelock would have, how Ockham would have presented in England. He would have dressed up like that, and he would have been one of the first Native Americans to appear on any kind of stage or in any kind of public uh, in England or probably Europe who was not there as a specimen of some exotic race from across the ocean. He was there as kind of a peer professional. Here's the Indian preacher. Now, even as such, he would have been a novelty, um, and he would have been kind of a spectacle, and people would have gone to see him for that reason, but he carried it off extremely well, as we've seen. But he gets back, and he finds out that um, Wheelock has abandoned his, his plan. So he writes him a letter, a very bitter letter, and he says this, I am very jealous that instead of your seminary, and Dartmouth, like Yale, was essentially, like Harvard, they were essentially seminaries uh, there to train ministers. Instead of your seminary becoming alma mater, she will be, be to alba mater, to suckle the tawny. So he makes a wordplay in Latin, substituting for alma, which is nourishing, alba, which is white. So he's saying, your, your institution is gonna be too white to nourish the natives, which was the original plan. And then he goes on, many gentlemen in England, in, in this country too, meaning back in the colonies, say if you had not this Indian buck, Ockham, you would not have collected a quarter of the money you did. And it's calculated that the amount that Dartmouth gave, something like 12,000 pounds, would, would be a couple million dollars today. Pretty good start for an, for an endowment. Anyway, so, um, that was, that's kind of the end of that chapter. And you know, in my Dartmouth presentation, I sort of focused on that, but that was kind of too bad because 
it wasn't a chapter that ended well for Occam, but it also wasn't <clears throat> really the story of his life. I mean, it was a single chapter in his life. He went on to do other things. The main thing he did, well, he went, <clears throat> at some point he went back to Long Island. He led a, a successful revival among the Shinnecock. And he ventured further afield. He ventured to Oneida lands. And I looked at, just before this, I looked at the map. Where are these Oneida lands? I sort of knew. <clears throat> They're way up between Syracuse and uh, Utica, a long, long way to go in his day. But the idea was there were connections among various tribes at this time, and he had a plan um, to establish um, a pan-tribal Christian community, which they called Brotherton or Brother Town. Uh, and it first formed um, in North New Stockbridge, Massachusetts, during the War for Independence, and after the war was over, uh, it relocated to to Oneida lands. Um, Occam moved there in 1785, and he died there. 1785. He moved there in 1785, uh, and he died there uh, in 1792. And you see, there's still a marker there um, commemorating that Indian Presbyterian preacher. I should have said if I didn't that when he was ordained as a minister, and when he was ordained, it was not by the Congregational Church, which was his original sponsor, his Wheelock connection. He sort of got fed up with them. and But the Presbyterians took him up, and he was ordained as a Presbyterian minister uh, in, of the, in, the, in Suffolk County in New York in 1759. But now we're, we're way ahead in time. He's moved, um, he's become part of this pan-tribal uh, culture, this pan-tribal community, which he helped to found. Um, they move, um, they, they gather first in, in Massachusetts, then on Oneida lands, and eventually um, in the 1830s, they removed again. Now, the 1830s is the period of Indian removal, which is famous for the, for the infamous uh, Trail of Tears. This tribe uh, seemed to have moved voluntarily. They relocated to Wisconsin, uh, and they still exist, and in fact, um, Oh, I, I, this is kind of sad. Uh, a marker, they don't seem to know exactly where his grave is, but they, they point you in that direction. Uh, a couple years ago, <clears throat> um, the Brotherton community in Wisconsin um, commissioned this ball-jointed doll uh, as, a, as a commemoration of his raising all this money um, in, in, the, in the 1760s. Uh, you can see him, he's got his clerical robes on, clerical collar, but he also has a native necklace. And he's seated in front of, a, he's got a writing desk, he's got a pen in one hand, an uh, ink pot in the other hand, and he's, he's ready to write. So he's kind of, you can see the sort of the mixture of cultures here, which I like. And um, this was sold in a, in a limited edition, and I'm pretty sure if you go to the, the, the Mohegan Museum, you can see they, they, they have one there, I'm quite sure. Um, around that time, around the time his, his tribe removed, um, his, he had a very much younger sister. I mean, he died in 1792. He had a sister who was alive in the 1830s uh, when this church was um, founded in, in Mohegan. The Mohegan Congregational Church still exists, was restored in 2003, and it looks like any other Protestant church of the time based on Christopher Wren models from England, but it does have this distinctive detail which, of which I have a, a close-up uh, in the slide as well. And these things matter. Um, the it was important that the tribe has this church because it, first of all, it, since they were considered sort of civ a civilized tribe, they were not subject to some of the kind of um, oppression that other tribes might be. And second, they're having had this church as a community center from the 1830s on, uh, helped them establish their continuity as a tribal unit, which helped them make the case for uh, recognition which they got in uh, the, uh, I have the date somewhere, I think 1994. Um, uh, so, you know, this, this I think is also part of Occam's legacy. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> for me, here's the English professor coming, his legacy is really his writing. Um, he left behind a significant body of work, su sufficient significant enough that Oxford University has published this collective writings of Samson Occam, comma, Mohegan, uh, subtitled Leadership and Literature in 18th Century Native America. I took the, the photo from the angle I did so you could see it's, it's a substantial volume, 
Well, what did he leave? Well, mostly unpublished works, journals, <clears throat> letters, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but some published works. Uh, during his lifetime, his most famous work was, sadly, Sermon on the Execution of Moses Paul. Moses Paul was a Native American who got drunk one night and killed somebody outside of a bar, was quickly caught and condemned. Uh, I guess he was given his choice instead of a last meal, <laughs> your last sermon. So he asked Occam to preach his last sermon, and Occam agreed. And uh, it sometimes shows up in anthologies. It's pretty long, and I wish you luck teaching it to undergraduates today. <laughs> it's basically a missionary argument against, um, against alcohol. And, you know, uh, I've read it, but I wouldn't try to teach it. But in addition to that, he, he, uh, he left a book of hymns. He didn't write the music, but he wrote the words. Um, a choice collection of hymns and spiritual songs intended for the edification of sincere Christians of all denominations by Samson Ockham, Minister of the Gospel, um, and both young men and, anyway, there's a quotation at the bottom, uh, printed and sold by Timothy Green and as, as a chair of, as, as somebody from the London Landmarks I have to show you, this is Timothy Green's uh, building on Lower State Street. It wouldn't have looked like that uh, in Occam's day, but it still exists, like the shepherd's tent. <clears throat> and Timothy Green was a famous printer in the, in the revolutionary era. So he left um, hymns, he left other sermons, uh, he left a, uh, some uh, notes on herbal remedies, he wrote a brief ethnography of the Montucket tribe, um, but for me, the main uh, exhibit is his short narrative of his life, which was never published. He wrote it uh, shortly after coming home from England, <clears throat> and before the, the Dufferin College disaster. And it's an extremely interesting text for someone who studies life writing, as I do, and I'm going to take you through some of the passages. Um, I, to do this, I, I looked, oh, I should say that also that the Occam's papers were repatriated to the Mohegan tribe last summer, and I was glad to see that in the, the London Day actually covered it. I was afraid they wouldn't. I was going to volunteer to go and do it, but they had somebody do it and I couldn't even go. It wasn't supposed to be open to the public, but I'm glad they covered it. So the papers are there, um, and you can see a lot of them online. And looking at them online, I came across a facsimile copy. I've never seen a facsimile copy of the short narrative. And in that, I came across this passage, which is not included in the anthology, which annoys me no end. This is a little preface to the narrative, which goes like this. <clears throat> Having seen and heard several representations in England and Scotland, Scotland, made by some gentlemen in America concerning me, and finding many gross mistakes in their accounts, I thought it my duty to give a short, plain, and honest account of myself, that those who may hereafter see it may know the truth concerning me. Though it is against my mind to give a history of myself and publish it whilst I am alive, yet to do justice to myself and to those who may desire to know something concerning me and for the honor of religion, I will venture to give a short narrative of my life. Now, the narrative is what we scholars of life writing call an apologia. The term is related to the term apology, but think of it as the opposite of an apology. In an apology, you apologize. You say you were wrong. In an apologia, you say, I was right. You were wrong. An apologia is a defense. So he's making clear here, He's saying, well, I didn't want to write this autobiography, and pretty much all 18th century autobiographers will say that. It was kind of a, a stand. You couldn't, you couldn't say, oh, I've been waiting to write this. You have to say, oh, didn't really want to do this. I know it's egotistical, but I have to, for the sake of religion, or in this case, to correct injustices. So you have a little ap apologia for the apologia, <laughs> a defense of the defense. Uh, the defense of the defense is... is, is typical, but his apologia is not. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's sincere. I mean, he, he really was wounded by the criticism, uh, and he really takes, takes into these uh, people who have, who have misrepresented him, as, as we'll see. Um, the narrative itself starts with this paragraph, which I think may have shocked some of my students. <clears throat> I was born a heathen and brought up in heathenism till I was between 16 and 17 years of age at a place called Mohegan in New London, Connecticut, in New England. 
New London was once, you know, included Groton, Monville, and all this. So when you said New London, it doesn't mean downtown. Uh, my parents, um, my parents lived a wandering life, as did all the Indians at Mohegan. They chiefly depended upon hunting, fishing, and fowling for their living, <clears throat> and had no connection with the English, excepting to traffic with them in their small trifles. And they strictly maintained and followed their heathenish ways, customs, and religion, though there was some preaching among them. Uh, so there was a, 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 once a fortnight. Now I have a couple things to say about it. One, one is. This is a claim to authority. He's claiming to be like his audience. Imagine he's writing to and for uh, a white English audience. He's saying, well, I'm like you. I'm not a heathen. I'm, I'm a full convert like you. Um, he's also saying, but at the same time, I have to say, he's actually, he's not telling the complete truth here. He's shading it a little bit. It's not true <clears throat> that his family had no connection with the English. How do we know this? He was, after all, named Samson. And his parents were named Joshua and Sarah. These are biblical names. So even before his mother converted, unless she took that name as a convert, I don't know. But uh, evidently, Samson was named Samson at birth. His family had some awareness of the Bible and of Bible stories. Um, and he would have known some English. He would have grown up knowing some English, as his parents probably did. Uh, I forgot to say he was a direct descendant of the great Sachem um, Uncas, who, whose life spanned almost the entire 17th century, and who I think was responsible for the split uh, of the Mohegan from the Pequot. So he came from a good lineage, but that people in that people in that line would have would have had a lot of contact with the English, going beyond just what he says. Uh, Traffic with, in their small trials, by, by which he means, I think, trade, you know, for, for little trade items. So he would have had more uh, uh, connection with the English than he says here. Um, but I'm, I'm try, I've tried to explain why he says that, to make it seem like he made a radical, radical uh, transition. Um, I should say a little bit here about the difference between Protestant conversion and Catholic conversion. I used to tell my students if a priest came to your Indian community, you would rather have a French priest come. And they say, well, I think if the French priest came, he said, oh, yeah, I get it. I believe in the Trinity. <laughs> I'm a Christian. And they would say, you know, bless you. <laughs> uh, come to confession and you're okay. I'm, I'm joking. But the, the French were much more liberal, I think, about the natives retaining their culture. The Protestants, not so much. Remember, Catholic with a small C, C means inclusive, universal. The Catholics were much more welcoming. Protestants, they were the descendants of the, of the Puritans. The Puritans wanted to... They wanted to limit the congregation to the saved. Catholics were different. So if you wanted to convert to Protestantism, you had to learn to read because Protestants are all about individuals reading the Bible and interpreting on their own. And what happens when individuals interpret on their own is they start thinking differently. And that's why, um, although Catholics may have more children, Protestants have more sex. OK, thank you. <laughs> PTS. Um, no, it's true. It's true. It's it's a good joke because it has a point to it. Okay. No. All right. But um, so, but so I think you know. So it, it's not a simple thing when when the English the English come and if someone like Occam wanted to convert, he had to really convert. And the the English set up during the 17th century these so-called villages of praying Indians, and there would have been the Indians there would have lived in houses, not wigwams. They would have dressed in English clothing. They would have been literate and so on. And they were. They did this, you know, for the natives' good, but also, of course, it meant they were safe. Okay, although during King Philip's War they were a little bit suspect because, you know, they're still native, they're still Indian. So, but Occam did this. He 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 converted, um, and he goes on in his narrative to tell about his story, going to Montauk, preaching, teaching, and so on. Then he comes back um, to his to his um, complaint. Uh, he had been accused of being extravagant. His employers complained that he was spending too much money. So here's what he had to say about that. They blamed me for being extravagant. I can't conceive how these gentlemen would have me live. I would wish they had changed circumstances with me but one month, that they may know by experience what my case really was. But I'm now fully convinced that it was not ignorance. He's saying, they didn't underpay me because they didn't know how much money I needed. How does he know this? 
For I believe it can be proved to the world that these same gentlemen gave a young missionary, a single man, a white man, 100 pounds for one year and 50 pounds for an interpreter and 30 pounds for an introducer. So it cost them 180 pounds in one single year. So Occam, he's presenting himself, he's a reefer. Now you see what difference they made between me and other missionaries. They gave me 100 pounds for 12 years service, which they gave for one year service in another mission. <clears throat> in my service, I was my own interpreter. I was both a schoolmaster and a minister to the Indians. Yea, I was a ear, eye, and hand, as well as mouth. I leave it with the world to judge whether I ought not to have had half as much as they gave a young man just mentioned. Now what can be the reason? That they used me after that, after the, after this manner, because I am Indian. It's obvious. So <clears throat> he does the math here. He gives an account of his life, an accounting of his life. He gives the details. He says, "Here's what it, um, I didn't need an interpreter. I know I, I speak native. Actually, interesting. When he went abroad." There were some people who, who were resisting it, and one complaint was, I have it, I have it, let me see if I have it, I think I have it here. Um, well, some of them said, well, you know, uh, he was probably um, acculturated from birth, so it's no big deal that he can do these things. You know, he didn't learn to do this during his lifetime. He was born and bred, up, bred uh, in these ways. And somebody else, um, other people say, well, you know, he actually, I hear he can't actually speak Indian. You know, he, so he was caught between these two things. He wasn't, he wasn't English enough for some, and he wasn't native enough for others, but he, did, he bridged the cultures very effectively. Um, but um, here he comes back to the fact that, you know, he's, he's, he's giving an accounting of himself. He's doing the math, you know, how many pounds they gave this guy for one year, they gave me for 12, they gave him, uh, and so on. And also, a friend, a, college, a classmate of mine asked me when I was going to do this talk, and I was like, is he, is he, the, is he the razor guy? <laughs> no, <laughs> he's, not, he's not the razor guy. But these are the razors, okay? These, this is where he takes the word and he uses them like weapons. <clears throat> so I'm going to wind up with just a few concluding remarks because I think that um, it's a very interesting legacy. Um, he... Uh, he, he championed his people. He may, he may look like a, a race traitor at some point. He may look like he's throwing the Mohicans under the bus uh, in that first paragraph. I grew up a heathen, uh, you know, but I'm not anymore. But he's not, he's not at all. And in fact, when he was preaching and teaching uh, on, on Montauk, he was living uh, a native life. He hunted, he fished, and he fowled. So he knew he hadn't given up the ways. What he did know is that the traditional life ways were not going to work for many people for very long. And they better look for a different way of life. And I think in Christianity, uh, he found a way to um, perpetuate his people's spiritual life. Uh, and even in the Psalms, I mean, he, apparently there were, there, were, there were Indian choruses at the time because the Indians sing. Uh, and this, this was a new material for them, which would have spiritual significance. He also acted <clears throat> politically. Um, I neglected to mention this, but among the things he that are in this, this anthology, he wrote petitions to uh, the overseer of the tribe, to the Connecticut colony, to the New York colony, New York state, and the U.S. Congress. So he lived long enough to, you know, through the revolution, through the, through the Revolutionary War, when the, when the colonies become states, <clears throat> the Indians had their needs. He also got involved in what was known as the, the Mason Controversy, John Mason is known, Captain John Mason is known around here. He's a terrible villain, you know. He helped to slaughter the Pequots. The Masons <laughs> adored him. The Masons ceded their land to him at some point. That's how much they trusted him. Why wouldn't they? <clears throat> um, but of course, Mason died, and he left kind of this legal tangle. What, what happens if he's, if he's the trustee of the land? Well, what's the status when he dies? So there was this three-way legal battle among the colony, the crown, and the tribe. And Ockham was warned, don't get into it. And some people worried if he was sent to England, he'd get into it. He'd intervene with the crown. Um, he did, and he was chastised for it. 
So he had this pattern during his life, uh, and I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, initially, I, I, when I pitched this to, to the library, I think I called it Samson Occam on and off the res, which is a little slangy, a little colloquial, a little modern. But what I meant was, first of all, that literally he didn't confine himself to the Mohegan territory. He went to Long Island, he preached among the Shinnecock, he went to the Oneida, <clears throat> he moved there in a community. And that community, incidentally, was kind of the, it was the manifestation of Wheelock's ideal. Wheelock wanted to found a town which would have Indian schools, Indian colleges, vocational education, and so on. Well, he didn't do it, but the closest thing that existed to it was probably Brotherton, though it didn't have a college. But uh, in some ways, I think Occam acted out Wheelock's dream without, without Wheelock's support. Um, but the other sense, in the other sense of the term, off, on and off the res, um, you can see it during his life, he kept going off the res metaphorically, and they would try to get him back on the res. They would try to keep him on a, on a short leash, and he would try to stretch the leash when he could. So he was very good, I think, at negotiating among the demands on him and championing the rights of his people. Um, and I think he lived out his life um, the way he wanted to. I think he probably the high point of his life was living uh, in this pan-tribal community. Um, and if you look if, if you look back at American history, it's kind of like a do-over of the Puritan experiment, the errand in the wilderness. You know, the Puritans come here to establish this sort of Christian utopia. Well, they kind of <laughs> wasn't that wasn't so good for the natives in many ways. But uh, natives wound up, in the case of Brotherton, picking up and moving to the United Lands where they could have their own kind of Christian utopia. So I see it as kind of in the tradition of American utopian communities, of which there were many uh, in the 19th century. So that's his legacy, and I think it's something to celebrate. <clears throat> <clears throat> Forty-five minutes, just like the way it's supposed to be, right? So, oh, sure. I mean, that's why I ended up because um, you're supposed to talk for forty-five minutes. I've watched these online, and at six o'clock, the feed dies, no matter what's happening here. So, wait, wait, wait. You know, um, so we have a leisurely fifteen minutes if people have questions or comments. Yes, Andy. <clears throat> This is, a, this, is, this is a really interesting interesting thing, and I didn't I hadn't thought about this until I started teaching this stuff. This is it seems counterintuitive. It takes a lot of land to support hunting gathering people. So what happens is when the English come, they're not hunting gathering. And I think the, the Indians thought, well, they live on such small parts of, you know, they can have a little village. You know, what's the big deal? Who who cares? Let them have some land, you know. Uh, but eventually, of course, uh, they grow in number, and in fact, uh, they do kind of spread out. Um, in my work uh, for New London Landmarks, I come across these. New London has the land records going back to 1646, uh, and at some point, some guy who was who had been a title searcher uh, camped out in in the uh, city hall and tried to reconstruct uh, the early um, division of lands. But uh, basically, in the 17th century, the early 18th century, the whole of the New London Peninsula was divided sort of crosswise into uh, lots. So the people would have a, a house, say, on what was what is now Pequot Avenue, and their lot, their land would stretch back across Montauk, because it wasn't there, to what is now Ocean. That would have been, so several blocks, so one individual would have had that much land, and maybe uh, a, um, a woodlot somewhere else. So the, the English weren't quite so, so compact, but they looked like they were, and they could have, you know, um, uh, go, uh, back gardens, and they could grow a few things around the house, and they could domesticate an animal, so that, that saves a lot of land. But Andy's right. Um, it takes a lot of land uh, to support hunting-gathering people, and by Occam's time, they didn't have it. They just didn't have it, so they couldn't do it. Uh, and they, they, didn't, they couldn't do it on the United Lands either. Yes, in back. Uh, Ockham had 10 children with Mary Fowler. Interestingly, he sent some to Moore's Charity School. Um, um, I don't think any of them went into the ministry. That's a, I, I don't know that. I haven't traced them. Um, 
I should have mentioned also that the year he was converted, uh, Ockham became a member of the 12 member tribal council. So you may see these things as being inconsistent. How can he be a Christian and also a Mohican elder? Well, he could, he did, one did. Um, yes, Janice. Well, it's a, good, it's a Mohegan name, and it's sometimes spelled O-C-C-U-M. No one seems to really know, but it's quite all right. If you see it's O-C-C-U-M, it's not wrong. But that's a Mohegan name, but of course, Samson is not. If who did? Oh. No. Uh-huh. Yeah, right, yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah. 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 I have no idea what he would have known about. Yeah. 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 I know, I know. The, the, the fact that those murals were there, were created there, is kind of a miracle. If you go to Hanover, don't miss the Orozco murals in the in the basement court. I used to study down there. Like, mm. <laughs> you know, they're, they're really fierce. But um, our basement of Dartmouth, uh, of Baker Library, which which had it, which had it, its steeple. I mean, the steeple is, is a, the tower was topped by that uh, that uh, weather vane that I showed you with Eliezer Wheelock and, and, and a stereotype of stereotypical Indian with a feather. Yes. Well, it was the it was the largest single gift by far, twelve thousand dollars, twelve thousand pounds, and as I said, in today's dollars, probably about two million dollars. So, you know, huge. And uh, and you know, and Ockham says to me about if you didn't have this Indian buck, and it's probably true. You wouldn't. You know, he was he was the deal. He sold. He sold it, you know, by the by preaching abroad. Yes, one, two, three. Yes, Willard. Yeah. So he rode upstream. No, well, I mean, there were roads, and what? Oh, uh, well, you know, I I looked I looked into that, and he shopped around. Um, he looked at a place um, up the Hudson, um, and I don't know why. Um, why he chose Hanover. Um, it, it is on a river, which help, which is helpful. If you come, want to go downstream, it's helpful. Um, I don't know why he chose Hanover. He did, but he did he did look around at other sites. He actually traveled to other sites, including one up near Albany, I think. So it was closer to, to uh, Lebanon. And it was the closest to Lebanon of the two or three sites that he looked at. Maybe he got a deal. <laughs> yes, but in the blue. Oh, thank you so much. Sure. Hmm. Well, the hymnal I think probably would have would have been probably adopted in in Protestant churches only. You know, um, he I think he actually met. Is it possible? How what century is Isaac Watt? Watt is it Watt or Watt? Yeah, so I think he actually met Isaac Watt in England. Isaac Watt uh, today we sing we. People who sing, there are still songs by Isaac Watt that are sung, uh, and you know, so he would have coined the words to traditional tunes, and they might have, they probably would have been distributed by church networks, congregational and pre Presbyterian. I should have mentioned another thing. He is on the things you come across. He is honored on June fourteenth by the Presbyterian Church. I came across a reference somewhere to. Today we will celebrate <laughs> Samson Ockham hundreds of years later. So he made a name in that church, um, which lives till this day. Um, but again, I think, and the other, the sermon, the sermon of uh, the execution time was going through multiple editions, um, and I don't know who would read that. I mean, those things passed again, again among church church members. Um, most of the other stuff wasn't published. Yes, and in front, please. Yes. I'm just wondering if Dartmouth is invalid now. Because it was 
Yeah, no, good. That's fair. I, I sort of skipped over that. It took 200 years for Dartmouth to um, establish a Native American Studies program. It happened just after I grew up. Two, things, two good things happened after I left. It went co-ed, <laughs> and they got Native American Studies program. I was born too soon. Um, and uh, in, I was hoping somebody was in tribe with you, because um, in the late 90s, a young Mohegan woman enrolled, Sarah, I want to say Sarah Brown, and the Dartmouth uh, Club of, the local Dartmouth Club had a meeting at which they had the head of the Native American Studies program come down, and it was sort of, it was probably about, oh boy, we're so glad we have this direct descendant of Samson Ockham enrolled in the college. And by that time, they, you know, they had, this is 20 years into the Native American Studies program, they, they had lots of Native students. But um, her father came, and her father was then the uh, tribal chairman. And at some point, and they had the Native American um, director come down, and Sarah was there, and probably a couple of other professors. Uh, and at some point, her father stood up and said, uh, I've been to Hanover, and I've met the then president, who was James Friedman, and I told the president that we consider, we Mohicans consider uh, Samson Ockham to be A, if not the founder of Dartmouth. The implication being, if Dartmouth would do something to recognize him, maybe the tribe would <laughs> give some of its money. I don't know that anything so crass, ha well, they certainly didn't call it Ockham College. They weren't going to do that. There are, there, there is, I think, the Native Studies Center bears his name now. And it, um, but two years after that, uh, the Dr. London Magazine published an article by a German scholar. You know how much Germans love Indians. Um, and it was called The Betrayal of Samson Ockham. And that was, I think, the first time that the college kind of publicly acknowledged this betrayal. Um, so, yes, Dartmouth was embarrassed. Uh, I think in the 1970s, you know, got rid of the Indian mascot, started the Native American Studies program, and has been recruiting uh, heavily. It probably has a larger Native uh, uh, population than the other Ivies, certainly, and has made, I think, some, something of a name in that way. Um, and a couple of years ago, I didn't hear, hear about it in time to, to go, uh, Columbia was the site of a, of a little ceremony. And this was actually, I think, organized by the native alumni of Dartmouth. Um, but the dignitaries came, and they kind of updated some of the, the stone monuments there. The, the monuments there were a little misleading about, about the relationship between Moore's Indian Charity School and Dartmouth. Like, it became Dartmouth. No, it didn't. Uh, and so I think the college has, has come clean, uh, and I think it's no longer embarrassed. But it had to pay a, you know, it had to pay a debt. Yeah, Stuart. Do you want to speculate on why they didn't go through with the bill that they go through with? Uh, no. Well, it's, you know, anthologies there are they're really conscious of space. Okay, but uh, for someone like me, I'm a student of genre. You know, like he's spelling out his genre here. You know, his motive. Uh, and in, I would say that nonfiction, particularly memoir, is different from fiction. The question of genre is, what is it doing? You know, he's not just telling his life story. He's got a grudge, <laughs> and he's pursuing that grudge. He's defending himself against charges that were made, which he thought were false. And why not? I mean, it's, it's clear. I mean, you can sort of figure this out uh, just by reading the text itself. But why not let him tell you uh, right up front what his, what his intentions were, what his, what his design was there? So that's my, that's my speculation. I'd love to think about this, the Samson story. If he's Samson, who's Delilah? Wheelock? Because Wheelock was kind of sapping his strength at times. He doesn't pull down the temple, but he kind of undercuts it with his razor, the mixed metaphors. Okay, yes. Yeah, sorry, next to Andy. I'm sorry, not your name. In the green skirt or short skirt. Yes, uh, next, Andy, the woman next to you. Oh, I thought she had her hand up. Did you not? Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Oh, I, I was just wondering if you know, very close to where Ockham was active uh, in, Western Ohio, in Western Pennsylvania and Ohio from the 70s and 60s up to the early 1800s. Hmm. We have constant, hardly hmm. very intense warfare hmm. with uh, Native Americans hmm. like, you know, hmm. one just yeah. more yeah. and yeah. Minnesota yeah. and Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever take a position on that? I don't, 
not to my knowledge. I mean, I think, I think going to the Oneida lands, they, they consider that a safe place. And I think, I don't know why they removed, I think the Oneida they needed more space themselves and they probably sort of suggested that the Brotherton community move, move away. I think he would have um, probably not. Um, and his community sort of sat it out yeah. in New Stockbridge. Um, I haven't read everything he wrote, so he, it might be there in letters. Um, I think he was probably too, well, I, I, I don't know about that. I can't really, shouldn't answer that. So. Any other, yeah? Oh, um, well, uh, I wanted to just show you two things. There's the um, Tantaquidian Museum on the Mohegan Reservation. Um, there's a wigwam, which is there, a model wigwam. And he probably grew up in one of those. Uh, this is a birch, uh, bas bark, birch bark box, which was inscribed in Brotherton and sent home uh, to, the, to, the, to the reservation. And those things mean something. And that's, that's there among there in there. And there's that, the, the betrayal of Samson Ockham in the Dartmouth magazine. Um, the, the, the book I showed you, um, the introduction to the Oxford uh, version, is, is, has a good historical essay. And that would refer one to other sources. But he's, um, I was in touch actually when I was doing this with a historian. I, I lost his contact, or I would have been back in touch with him. Uh, who's at Columbia, and he's working on something like a biography. I mean, he's certainly worthy of a biography, and I'm sort of puzzled as to why it hasn't happened. I mean, admittedly, there aren't a lot of sources, but he, there's a lot of active scholarship in Native American studies today. You can find articles on his theology, on this and that. Um, so, um, but, th and this was published ooh, quite a while ago, this, this Oxford book, so it would be, the, the sources would be out of date, but um, his papers are at, at Mohegan, and beyond that, the sources are you know wherever you can find them. <clears throat> We're about to cut the feed, so <laughs> Fred. <laughs> oh no, no, sorry. There, no, there are murals. I had one in the other slide, so I don't have it in this. There's a mural which I think they probably don't show anymore, um, which shows. Eliezer Wheelock entering the wilderness, and there are Indians sort of crouching among the bushes, and there's you know also wildlife. There's sort of so it's you know people had a lot of fun with these things in the, like in the 30s, 1930s, and they would do these these murals, which now we're kind of embarrassed to have. But they're not going to destroy any of those murals. They they keep them for teaching purposes, which is what they should do. Well, get in with a song. Oh, Eliezer Wheelock was a very pious man. He went into the wilderness to teach the Indian. I sang that in the Glee Club at Dartmouth. It goes on. It gets more embarrassing as it goes on. But it says, with a with a with a gratisad parnasum, which withered is a kind of a Latin textbook, right? Would you know this? I don't. A Bible and a drum, and five hundred gallons of New England rum. Now the the rum is not for the Indians. They were paranoid about the natives drinking, but that's Dartmouth. <laughs> <laughs>